Okay, inshallah. Inshallah, everybody should be able to hear me. Okay, let's get started. In alhamdulillah, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of our uh, series on uh, the resurrection. The resurrection, the signs of the last hour. And before we begin uh, tonight's discussion, the last time, let's get caught up with what we dis uh, talked about uh, the last time we met for this class, the last time we met for this class, we spoke about how um, on the day of judgment, after the people are raised up, when they are raised up from their graves, we talked about what will happen with the believers, the people who died in good standing with the law. They will be clothed in garments of silk and they will be placed on thrones, some of them, thrones of light. And also uh, we spoke about how on that day we'll have to cross that Surat bridge. Even though you are sitting on a throne of light under the shade of Allah, as we discussed yesterday in our hadith class, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no one who enters paradise will enter it without settling the scores or the differences that he owed to the people in this world. That means we all have to go across that uh, Surat bridge with our book of, with our good deeds in our hand. And when the people see you sitting on that throne, they know that, oh, this is a person that's got a lot of good deeds. I hope that person did me some wrong so I can get some of those good deeds to get across this bridge. And we talked about that hadith yesterday. So even the people that's on that, 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 uh, that did the deeds that were pleasing to Allah in this world, they're not saved from that day they still have to get across that bridge and make up for any problems that they cause amongst the people, the people you back bit. This is why we have to be careful as women. I'm going to talk about the women a little bit more because we women got a problem with backbiting people and speaking bad about people, and even people that we don't know. That's just the nature of a woman. She just got us think the worst about a person. Maybe because of our own insecurities. I don't know. A lot of people ask me, why is it that women do this? You know, maybe her life, how she was raised. Maybe something tragic. Maybe she was abused and beat up as a kid. I don't know. I don't do that. But there are a lot of women that do. And whatever happens usually in your childhood carries over into your adulthood, even when you get old. So that when, and you get jealous and uh, when you hear anything good about somebody else, you want to tear them down because your life has not been good. You're really miserable. This is how women are. And this is why there's going to be more of us in hell. And that's why this Ramadan, I want you sisters to work on that, including myself. We all, as women, have to work hard to change that nature into what's pleasing to a law where we're not uh, uh, hating on people so easily. You hear something about a person and you automatically assume the worst and then start talking about that person or that person's family, their wives, their husbands, their children, their grandkids. Those are all things that's going to cost you your deeds. So you may be sitting on a throne of light because you used to perform your obligations. You wore hijab, you did your prayers, but you had a problem with your mouth. And when the other, the sinful Muslims, 
The sinful Muslims, who are the sinful Muslims? They will be the ones that will get their book of deeds behind their back. When they see you sitting on that throne, they're going to say, I hope that person owe me some deeds. I know her. I know him. I hope that they talked about me because they got to get a good deeds to me because I'm going to hell. I need to try. Maybe I can be redeemed this way. So we will get up off the throne. And we will be led across that bridge like everybody else. That brother there who you talked about, his children, here's your, you got to give them deeds up. And guess what? Not only are you giving away your good deeds, you taking his bad deeds. That's powerful, guys. And that's that hadith. That's why the prophet said your good deeds are not enough to get to paradise. You can have all the good deeds in the world. But you couldn't control how you treated other people. The things you said about other people. Because you had a problem with your insecurities or your jealousy. And this is us women. Our jealousies. So you got to give all them prayers, all them fasts, all that charity away to that person that you talked about and you didn't even know that person. You didn't know nothing about that person's life, their family, their background. That's tough. Am I hitting home with you sisters? And I'm also reminding myself, we hitting home. Remember I told y'all one of the things I used to love to do. Latifah's my best friend. I used to love when I was young, when I was 20, Y'all want to know how Layla spent her time in between school? Because I was working and going to school to get my degree. You want to know what me and Latifah used to do? I used to drag her out the house and make her do. My other friend, Aisha, she had babies. She couldn't go. We'd leave at 12 o'clock at night when I get off work because I worked second shift back then. When I get off work at 12, I would drag Latifah out the house. And y'all want to know what we used to do? We would go to Denny's because Denny's stayed open 24 hours. And we would sit there in Denny's eating breakfast. And I would sit there and make up stories about everybody that came into the restaurant. Latifah will tell you I did that. It was, I'm, I've always liked to imagine things, but that wasn't right. I would sit there and say, see that? Oh, look at that lady there, Latifah. Girl, let me tell you about what's going on in her life. And I would sit there and pretend that I knew what she was going through, that I knew about her husband, about her children. And I'd make it, I thought it was funny. I was only 20 years old. I probably was 18 or 19. I don't know. I was young. And Latifah's older than me. I was maybe 18. And Latifah would sit there. Y'all know Latifah. She's always been a sleeper. She sit there eating her pancakes, uh, 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 and be sitting there falling asleep while I'm sitting there telling everybody's, telling her what's going on in everybody's life that came in the restaurant. Cracking up laughing to myself. That was bad. I'm going to have to answer for that. I repented from it now. But if I hadn't repented from that, I'd have to answer for that. Because that's backbiting them people. And it was probably slandering them too. I didn't know none of them people, even though they were Kaffers. We can't even back by the slander Kaffers, guys. But that's how silly I was as a kid. Latifah tell you, that's all I would do. That's why I tell y'all I stay in the house. Because if I wasn't in my house, I'd be dragging her out of her house now. And we'd be going to Perkins. And I would sit in that restaurant and say, uh, 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 look, Latifah, see that man there? Girl, his wife died. You know he by himself probably would have got dogs. I would sit there and make up stories about people. That's what I do. So I know the evils of myself. That's the thing about Ramadan too, guys. You want to take this time to evaluate yourself, to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. I know my weaknesses. So I don't go out to dinner no more. I don't sit, go out to restaurants because that's what I do. So I'll sit in the house and order Instacart, and, uh, DoorDash, and sit here on the computer with y'all eating. Because that's my, something that I have to work on. I don't want to be sitting up, walking down that Sirot Bridge and having to give all the little bit of good deeds I got. Whatever good deeds I got, I got to give them away to somebody. 
because I sat there and made up stories about a person that I didn't know. This is deep. That Hadith is powerful that we talked about yesterday. Imagine all your good deeds down the drain because of this thing here, your tongue. That's why Abu Bakr used to pull his tongue. That's why Aisha, she used to hit herself for her tongue. Aisha was feisty. Aisha loved that She was very flippant. She had a wicked tongue. And she used to always reprimand herself about her tongue. Hafsa had a temper like her father. Hafsa used to uh, lose her temper, you know. And when she lost her temper, she could become vulgar. More vulgar than Aisha. So she used to reprimand herself too. This is something that we sisters have to work on. All right, because on this day, our good deeds ain't enough. You have to have earned the mercy of Allah. And how do we earn the mercy of Allah? By learning how to control our tongue. By learning how to control our tempers. It took a while for Aisha to learn. Aisha didn't learn until after the biggest calamity happened. And it was too late. When she led those 300,000 men on that battlefield, all them Muslims were killed. All them people were killed. She suffered with nightmares for the rest of her life. After that battle of the camel, she went home and she spent most of her nights crying, asking a lot to forgive her for that tragic move that she made because she was very emotional, feisty, wanted revenge. You know, subhanAllah, how many of us weep like she did? She spent the rest of her life just trying to make up for that tragedy. And by teaching the women, as the Islam spread throughout the Roman Empire, as Islam spread through the uh, Persian Empire, the women would come and she spent the rest of her life just focusing on teaching the religion and she stayed out of politics. She never got involved in the companion's politics no more. But look at what, what, she, what price that came with. 300,000 men. She ordered the death. She was behind the death of a lot of men that were killed in Syria. That was Aisha, my girl. But she will say she overstepped the boundaries. She used to say, I overstepped the boundaries. She said, I overstepped my boundaries as a Muslim woman and as a Muslim. But she repented. She made up for that. The companions weren't perfect, guys. They were like you and me. They made mistakes. And the reason why I'm sharing my story with you is because I'm not perfect. This is a problem I have. Y'all, the people in the Zoom room know, I'll sit here and make fun of stuff. I'll make up stories. I'll make fun of people if I'm put in a position to do so. I don't do it with my students in here. I, when I uh, play with you guys, it's always the truth. But when I was a younger I used to sit there and just make up whole life stories. I, I had a problem. I don't do it no more now. But I don't put myself in a position to do it either. I know that just like I did it back 40 years ago, I could do it again now. That was 40 years ago. I can go back to that if I was in that environment, but I ain't in it no more. My home, my home is better for me. Everybody get it? I'm like Aisha. I learned the hard way like Aisha did. So I'm like Aisha. I stay in my home like Aisha stayed in hers after that. All right. So the whole point of me telling this to you guys is to let you understand that the good deeds are not enough. We have to also earn the mercy of Allah. And how do we earn that mercy? By repenting from our sins in this world. Because there's no repentance in the hereafter. It's too late. You have to repent now in this world. 
and be determined to not put yourself in those situations again. Be determined to stop talking about people in a bad way. Be determined that I'm never going to open my mouth and say something about a person or their family when I don't know these people. I'm not going to sit up and make up stories about people that I don't know. That's what I had to do. I'll take my storytelling to a book. And that's when I started writing. I'll write fiction novels because that's okay. But I'm not going to sit up and try to make up stories about people no more. And that's what we have to do. Okay? Change yourself. Otherwise, after you go across that bridge, if you don't have one deed in your hand, if you don't have that one, one deed in your hand, you're going to touch that hell fire, guys. And again, the believers don't want to spend not even a second in hell. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you get out of hell? If you are one of those Muslims, and it's going to be a lot of us, a lot of us will be those Muslims that got to do some time in hell because of our mouth. How do we get out? That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I have four questions from last the, the other day that I want to ask you guys just to make sure you guys are paying attention to me because I'm taking all this time to teach y'all and depriving myself of sleep. And I got the uh, the program open where we can see the answers. Uh, y'all can see the answers from the people on the people on Facebook. You can see the answers from the people on Zoom and the people, I mean, on the people on YouTube. The people on YouTube, you can see their answers by looking at the thing there to the side. The people on Twitter, you can see, everybody should be able to see everyone's response. So type your response. Let's look at the first question. On the day of judgment, who will be the person to intercede on behalf of the people? Go ahead, Sister Aisha. That will be um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Does everybody agree with her answer? She said it would be the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who will intercede for the people on the day of judgment. Anybody disagree? Mashallah, that answer is correct. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will intercede on behalf of the people. And that brings us to the second question, which gets a little bit harder. Who can explain in detail without filibustering? Who can explain in detail why it is that the Prophet Muhammad will be the only uh, one to intercede for the people? And I mean, explain well without missing a good point. Go ahead and try it, Zarina. All of the prophets... Um had a, a dua or um, a wish that, um, that um, Allah gave them. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only prophet that um, prayed to intercede for his people. Um, and like, for example, Prophet Solomon asked to be a king and get a kingdom. And um, so Prophet Muhammad is the only one. He's the only one that did what? Made, um, wanted to intercede for us on the day of judgment. His, his followers. The other, the other prophets didn't want to intercede for their people? They all had different wishes. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only one that um, made that kind of prayer or, or wish. What do you guys think about her answer? Anybody disagrees with her answer? Did y'all listen quite, quite carefully to her answer, my other students? Everybody agree with her answer? Yes, me. Go ahead. Yes, I agree with her answer. You do? Okay. Aisha, you agree? Yeah, I agree with her answer. And like she said, how um, I also will say how um, I don't know if I really heard all of it, but. Wait a minute, before so you mine... give your answer, this is <laughs> what I want y'all to do is pay attention to what people say. Zarina, give your answer again. And Aisha, listen. Y'all have to listen. So y'all can recognize the truth from, from, from stuff that's passed over. 
Give your answer again, Zarina. And I want everyone to pay attention. Go ahead. Okay. Um, all the prophets were given um, a wish um, by Allah gave them a wish of something that they, he would grant to them. And like, for example, Prophet Solomon or Prophet Solomon wished to be have a kingdom. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, made a wish or do I that he can intercede for um, his ummah, his followers on the day of judgment. Do y'all agree with her answer? Did y'all listen carefully to it? Is there something wrong with her answer? Okay, now the hands go up. Let's see. Brother Noor, what do you have to say? Go ahead. She's, uh, she's right, but the part that she's missing the most is that our our prophet was the only one that wanted to help these people in the day of judgment, even especially the people that are simple. Y'all agree people. with him? Sabrina, let's hear from the baby. Go ahead, Sabrina. Um, Prophet Muhammad actually saved his wish. Yeah. Hello! That's my baby! Oh, God, let me get on this mic. Why is it that the babies get it right and you women, you adults, don't? She caught it. Say it again, Sabrina, for these people. Um, he saved his answer. Hello! Y'all hear what she said? Zarina, you see why your answer's wrong? He saved his wish. How old are you, Sabrina? You're on TV. Tell the people how old you are. I'm only nine years old. This is a nine-year-old child. And she picked up on the error of what she said. Why is it that you adults can't do that? Is it because you're old and your mind is feeble? <laughs> the children... My children can come in here and run rings around them. I bet you Zarina's daughter would have picked up on it too. If Zarina's daughter is listening, she probably would have got on that mic and said, Umi, you wrong. No, the prophet Muhammad did not ask Allah to let him intercede for his people. He said, Allah, let me save that wish. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to save it for the day of judgment because I may need it to help my people. You get it now, Zarina? Y'all get it, Brother Noor? Yes. Y'all got to pay attention to how y'all recite y'all word these hadiths. Y'all missed the main me the meaning. The main meaning of that hadith, he and I gave y'all 50 different hadiths. And I'm exaggerating 50, probably about 10. 10 hadiths where the prophet said, I reserved my wish. Reserve means to save. I saved my wish. All the other prophets that the one had the last hadith I gave y'all that the prophet said, all the other messengers. And all the other prophets used that wish in this world. I didn't use it. I have not used that wish yet. And I'm not going to use it until the day of judgment. The children understand what I'm teaching. They grow up and become my best students. Like Pfizer. Pfizer would have caught it. Because she was the same age as Sabrina coming in here learning. <laughs> and it sticks in the kid's mind. So I want y'all to remember, why is it that the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu, I'm so proud of you, Sabrina. Uh, uh, make sure you take her out and get her, some, get her a present or something. You know, her parents. Y'all take her out and reward her. This girl is brilliant. She reminds me so much of me when I was her age. That's how I was with Mukhtar's father and his mother. I was their best student. God. 
Take her out and get her a present. She deserves it because the girl's, she's brilliant. Okay, so that's what, why, guys. Why is it that the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would be the only prophet to intercede for the people? Because he saved his one wish for the day of judgment. That's it. He didn't make that wish yet, Sir Zarina. I want y'all, he hasn't made his wish yet. He'll make it on the day of judgment. He told us what the wish will be, but he has not granted that gate. He hasn't made it yet. He's going to reserve it for the day of judgment till he see what happened because he knows his people are going to need it. So he has not made that wish yet. He just told us what he plans to do with it. But has he done it yet? No. It's reserved for the day of judgment. Words, how we explain stuff is everything because it changes the meaning if we don't explain it correctly. Okay, look at the next question. Let's see how y'all do it. How, be careful how y'all words things. Number three, what reason will Noah have? to fear on that day. And the reason why I ask this is because we talked about how the people will run to prophet Noah, alayhi salam, asking him to intercede, but he won't because he said, he will say, I have my own fears to worry about. Who can tell us what fears, what fear will he have on that day to worry about? Okay, Yasmin wants to redeem herself. You let the nine-year-old outsmart you. Go ahead, so you ask me. Okay. Um, Noah will be scared because when his people turned away from Allah, um, they rejected Allah, so he just asked Allah to punish them all. Exactly. What do y'all think about her answer? Everybody else? Y'all agree with her answer? Yes. Anybody disagree? Let me look on YouTube and stuff. Yeah, good job. Mashallah. Yeah, exactly, guys. That's what he has to... Uh, uh, to, to oops, I'm sorry. I'm screen sharing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. I'm sorry. I hit the wrong button. Yeah, that's what uh, Noah will fear on that day. You know, he's going to fear the fact, even though, I mean, he he's going to be afraid that maybe Allah will decide to punish me. Because I didn't have the patience with the people. He will think that he didn't have enough patience. I'm the one that made Dua asking Allah to destroy the people. He said, maybe Allah is going to decide to punish me. So he's going to be afraid of that. Good job, Sister Kitty. As Sister Kitty said, Noah asked Allah to destroy the disobedient people. Exactly, Sister Kitty. That's what he's going to be afraid of on that day. Okay, so that's why he's going to tell the people, I'm worried about myself. I ain't got time for you. I'm hoping that Allah is still going to forgive me, you know, for that. Even though Allah didn't, didn't, didn't punish me for it. Let's look at the next question, number four. I hope you guys can get it right, Bethany and Elizabeth. What reason will Jesus, alayhi salam, have? to fear on that day? Who can answer that question? When the people go to Jesus, he's going to say, nope, nope. I'm worried about myself. Why will he be worried about himself on that day? Let's see. Go ahead, sister. Um, let's see who's got their hands up. Sister Sabrina, go ahead. Because the people worship him. Exactly. Mashallah. You know, Jesus is going to be worried for himself that day because Supana Allah, you know, he, he, he even though he didn't tell the people to worship him, they did. So he's going to be wondering, Supana Allah, maybe Allah might want to punish me because of what you people did. He's going to say, even though I never told anybody to worship any other than Allah, but because the people worship me, celebrated a birthday, 
Oh, he's going to talk about it. He's going to talk about that birthday. He's going to say, I never told the people to worship me. I never told the people to set aside a day to celebrate and worship me and my birth. He's going to say that, but because the people did it, maybe a law might want to punish me. So he's going to say, I can't um, uh, uh, speak on your behalf. I got my people to contend with. They took a day and set it aside out the year to worship me. Plus, they used to call upon me when they made their prayers. When they made their prayers, they called upon me and they set aside a day to worship me. That's the birthday. Y'all better stop that birthday crap because that's what y'all doing. Y'all worshiping yourselves and your children. Okay, good job. And what about the next question? What reason will Moses have on that day? The people will run to Moses. And Moses would tell him, I can't uh, intercede for you. I got myself to worry about. I'm scared for myself. What reasons do or reason does Moses have to be afraid on that day? Go ahead, Norto. The reason that Moses had, I mean, what the reason Moses will fear on that day, the reason he has is that um, he's going to say, um, when they come to him, people asking for him to intercede, he will say, Oh, um, I've killed a person, so that's his reason. Then he will say, go to the other, you know. Exactly. Moses killed a man. You know, like I tell y'all, Layla goes for the bad boys. (laughs) Moses was tough, strong, tall, muscular at the top, lean at the bottom. Oh, yeah, tall, tall man. He was the color of your coffee. People ask me, how did Moses look? He was a brownish color, a light brownish color. He was the color of your coffee. He was Hebrew. Y'all don't know the Hebrews are part of the uh, the black race. They don't want to admit it. Just like the Arabs don't want to admit that they the part of the black race too. Okay. But yeah, he was the caramel color, the color of my coffee. Y'all know that coffee I like to drink from Starbucks. That's the color Moses was. He had long, wavy hair, came down to his shoulders. My future husband, he's a fine man. And he's one of the bad boys. Don't mess with him because he had a temper. One of the bad boys with that temper. He got mad, gave one punch, knocked that man down and killed him. Just like when that angel of death came to take my future husband's soul. He said, what? What you talking about? Bam, one punch. And he knocked out the angel of death's eye. And do y'all know how strong and mighty the angel of death is? Angel of death went crying back. Allah, look, look what he did. He took my eye. And Allah had to put the eye back. That's my future husband. Moses. Moses, even my Moses, he's going to be afraid that day too. When the people go running to my tall, handsome Moses, holding that staff in his hand, he going to look at the people and say, I can't do it. I'm worried. Who that sound like? That sound like my old man in this world. Hello. I lost my temper. Punched the dude. He died. Go ask somebody else. I can't help you. That shows how horrific. That shows how horrific that day will be, guys. That's a day for us to fear. If the prophets of Allah, and by the way, we're going to talk about that today. The prophets will not be in hell. None of the prophets. Allah has already forgiven them. Okay. They will enter into paradise after us. 
after our nation enters paradise, the prophets will enter after us. They're not going to hell. But to show how fearful that day will be, none of the prophets of Allah will take it for granted. Y'all understand that? None of the prophets of Allah will take that day for, for granted, take Allah's uh, mercy for granted. They will be afraid that maybe Allah will change his mind. Maybe Allah done had second thoughts about what they did. The same way you and I do. How many of us repent? And then we think about it. I hope Allah forgave me for the things I used to make up about people I didn't know. I mean, I was 20, but it happened. I'm 62 now. He might hold it against me. We don't know if Allah accepts our repentance or not. We have hope that he does. Well, the same way that we worry like that, the prophets were humans too. They're not going to take Allah's uh, mercy for granted either. So that's why when the people go running to them on that day, they will say, I myself, 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 I got some things that, that I did too that I don't even know if Allah is going to forgive me for. So I can't speak on your behalf. They will all send them to people, to the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because the prophets of Allah, they all know that the best of them, the best of them is the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because guess what? Out of all those 124,000 prophets that Allah sent, he was the only one. That's why I'm surprised y'all didn't get that answer right, Yasmin. He was the only one that chose to reserve his wish for the day of judgment. He's the best of them all. Moses didn't think to do that. Abraham didn't think to do that. Noah didn't think to do that. Solomon didn't think to do it. Idris didn't. Adam didn't. And he's the father of us all. Even he didn't think to do it. Only the prophet Muhammad did. SubhanAllah. What a wonderful man. Can't wait to meet him. Let's hope that we all get to meet the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When I meet him, it'll be with respect and awe. And after meeting him, I want to say, can I, see, can I meet Aisha? You know, y'all know I love Aisha. That's why the Prophet Muhammad ain't my husband, out of respect for her. Then after meeting her, okay, where Moses? Moses! <laughs> Boy, let's hope we all make it to paradise. I mean, I mean, I mean. Okay, so this is what we spoke about the last time that we did this class. Now, for those of us who didn't pass the selling of the scores, we got off the throne and did that walk. Throne man walking, throne man walking. Who's going to take my deeds? For those of us that ain't got that one deed left, we got to fall down into that hellfire, even if it's for a second. That's the dipping that we talked about. Remember, we talked about in my series on paradise. Some of us have to do, do the dipping because nobody's going to enter paradise until they understand that there was nothing in this world that's haram that they thought was good, okay? Maybe you did a lot of good deeds that got you on that throne. You know, you used to make your prayers at the mosque, but you still didn't understand that polygamy is good and clean. Some people got a problem with polygamy. You didn't understand that makeup, let me put it this way for you brothers, makeup is good and clean. You went around telling women that they can't be beautiful. You told women that they can't wear colors. You told women that they can't wear lipstick. You told women that they can't wear hijabs like what Layla got on, thanks to my Somalis, my Bantus, because it got bling. 
So you did all the prayers in the world. You did all the fasting in the world, but you didn't understand that everything Allah made lawful was good and clean. You got to be dipped. Dipped. You ain't got no deeds in your hand because you had to give it to all those women. Hello, all those sisters. You were the imam of a community. All those women that you told it was haram for them to wear beautiful hijabs and look like Layla. Don't listen to Layla. Layla wasn't nobody. Innovator, deviator, witch, whatever y'all call me. Okay? So you ain't got no deed left. You had to give it to all the women in your community and Layla. So Allah is going to look at you and say, well, you did all the goods that were pleasing. But you never understood that everything I made lawful is good and clean. You did not understand that my concessions were good and clean. So I'm going to have to dip you in this hellfire for just a second. But that one second will feel like a million years. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there will be some of us who Allah will dip in the hell fire just for a second to purify their hearts because you cannot enter paradise har harboring belief in your heart that something good is bad or that something bad was good. So you imams out there going around being oppressive towards women, you're going to have to go through that dipping. And what's going to bring you out of that dipping? You're going to be dipped in that hellfire for a second, but a second can be like a million years in the hereafter. How will you come out of that second? How will any of us come out? That's the discussion I'm going to have right now. Let me put this PowerPoint up. So don't think that you all that in a bag of chips because you sitting on that throne. That's why you imams out there, you brothers out there, y'all got to be careful. Like I tell my students, be careful how y'all answer these questions. You brothers got to be careful too. You better be careful telling women that things is haram when it's not. If you don't have a clear verse that says thou shalt not wear lipstick, a clear verse, thou must be ugly and not wear colors. A clear verse, women of this nation must walk in black and cover their face and never put jewelry on. Unless you bring that evidence, you are hating the concessions of Allah. And guess what? The prophet's wives wore makeup and they wore colors. They never wore black. I want every Muslim woman listening to me. The prophet's wives never wore black or any dark color unless they were mourning. You will find these hadiths in Bukhari, Muslim, Muwatta, Termiti, all the Siddha. Aisha said the only time we wore dark colors was when we were mourning the death of someone. That's how we knew that a woman was in mourning. She would put on dark colors. Other than that, we wore bright colors. Aisha, it's in Bukhari. She was married in a red plaid dress. The women made a beautiful red plaid dress for her to get married in. The prophet's daughter, Zainab, I mean, she loved red too. Red has always been one of our favorite colors. She, when she was in Abyssinia, she married, was married to the richest man, Uthman, who was a multimillionaire. He bought her horses and bought her all the beautiful clothes. She was riding on a pony dressed in a beautiful red abaya. And Uthman was smiling and leading the pony in her. So I don't know where this this crazy stuff come from, from these oppressive imams telling you sisters that y'all can't be, wear colors. That is not Islam. Um, Salamis, um Salama's favorite color was blue. 
She used to wear blue garments of silk, blue garments of satin. And by the way, we can wear any fabric too. The prophet's wives, they loved silk. They loved satin. They loved brocade. And again, they never, ever wore anything dark unless they were mourning. So I don't know where these brothers get this stuff from y'all, these fanatical Muslims. Like I told y'all in my class today for the tall heat class, when you find people to learn from, they have to be moderate. Islam is a way of life based on moderacy. The way y'all see me dress, I'm moderate. My makeup is flawless. As Tyra Banks would say, flawless. But it's not overdone. It's moderate. I don't have no glitter. I don't have no gleam. I don't have no uh, lustry uh, wet lips, none of that crap. This is moderate. This is how women look, moderate. This is how Islam is, moderate, balanced. When you find people to learn this religion from, you don't want to learn from a fanatic who tells you everything is haram. And you don't want to learn from a lenient who tells you everything is lawful. You want to learn from the people who are balanced. And how do you know that they're balanced? Everything they say. Especially the lawful and the unlawful. Is based on what a law and the prophet said. And they give examples like I just, I just gave y'all examples from the lives of the prophet's wives. And I gave my Dalil. And I gave y'all the source. Dare to challenge me, brothers? Do you dare? I, ch I dare you. I dare you. And don't play the Arabic game. Because even though I can't speak fluent Arabic, I don't have a problem making that call to Sheikh Abu Atayyip, who can come in here and, ch and play the dare game with you. Well, I might even bring in Dr. Assam, PhD in Fusha, and a PhD in English, and a PhD in the Quran. Boy, that man got about six or seven PhDs. Dr. Assam, a brilliant man. May Allah bless him. All right. So there it is. How will the people come out of the hellfire? What, who will be allowed to intercede? Let's put this PowerPoint up on the screen and let's get down to the nitty gritty. You brothers and sisters too, cause women do the same thing too. I'm just singling out the brothers cause they love to single out women. It's nice to hear a woman single out the men and critique them for a change. So for you brothers who did all the good deeds, but you got to do a second in hell because you made things that were lawful, bad and dirty. How will you come out of that hell? Okay, well, let's talk about the accepted intercession. Okay. We have many hadiths and I'm always giving y'all the source. By the way, the Mutazila accused me of making up hadiths all the time. That's because they've never learned the hadiths. They learned based on fatwa, and that's the new bidder. The new innovation is that we don't read the hadiths no more. The prophet said that the sunnah would disappear. The sunnah will become abandoned. Instead of learning the hadiths, we're learning fatwa. We think that fatwa are hadiths, opinions, verdicts. We're at the Islam Q&A website. We're at the lislam.org, which I keep telling y'all is Shiite. We're on their websites looking at their fatwas all the time. When you need to be doing like I did, learn the meaning of these hadiths, learn the sitta. If you don't know what the sitta is or what it means, that means shame on you. You ain't a person of knowledge. All right. And I've given you guys many hadiths that speak about the two types of intercession. That will happen on the day of judgment. We talked about those hadiths in the last class. And the that intercession falls in two categories. The great intercession that will come from our prophet Muhammad 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for those people who make dua after hearing that adhan, remember we talked about that. Whenever you hear the adhan being called, you recite that supplication, asking Allah to give the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that station of praise and glory to let him occupy that highest rank in paradise. The Prophet said, anyone who makes that supplication, it guarantees you that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will intercede for you. So for all of us, whenever we hear the adhan, and that's all my students here, I know that's what you guys do because I see you doing it. If we're sitting here and we hear an adhan go off, we make that dua that guarantees you that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will intercede for you. That's the first type of intercession. Write it down. It's going to be on the quiz and don't get the wording wrong, students. All of you get the wording correct. Don't just let FISA be the only one that can word everything correctly here. The rest of y'all need to do it too. Okay. The second intercession will be the intercession that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has reserved. This is the wish that he reserved on that day. And he told us he hasn't made that wish yet. But when he makes it, he's going to prostrate before Allah and he's going to ask Allah to allow him to intercede on behalf of the sinful Muslims of his nation who did believe in Allah, who died upon major sins but they did not die upon disbelief. And we talked about that hadith last week. I mean, yesterday, well, how, when we're crossing that bridge, yeah, you done got off your throne. You crossing that bridge. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be standing at the end of the Sarat bridge because he would have made dua asking Allah to give him his wish now. And he will make his wish that any of my people who fall down into that hellfire because they don't have any good deeds. Oh Allah, allow me to bring them out as long as they believed in you. They didn't die associating partners with you and they didn't die denying anything that you said or did. That's his doer. So you imams, I'm using you brothers as examples because y'all like to pick on women all the time. My time to pick on you. You imams did all these good deeds with your coop buys and your charity and all your fundraisers and all of this, but you brothers kept telling sisters that it's haram for them to be beautiful. It's haram for them to wear colors. It's haram for them to wear makeup. Oh, you women going to hell. But none of this stuff was true. And the reason why you told them that is because you disliked something that was good. Everything that Allah made lawful is good and clean, including makeup, including Layla's lipstick. You don't like it. Allah said it's lawful, whether you like it or not. So you ain't got no deed. You gave all, all your good deeds went to the women that you told that to and Sister Layla too, all right? So now Allah will look at you and say, I can't have you enter paradise, Imam so-and-so, because you cannot enter my garden harboring any belief in your heart that something I made lawful is bad and dirty. So I'm going to have to dip you. I'm going to have to dip you in that hellfire because it will cause you to forget whatever you thought was bad that I made lawful. It will cause you to forget whatever you thought was good that I made haram. 
And the prophet will be standing at the end looking. He will say, my people, my people. And the angels will take you, imam, and dip you in at hell. And while you are being dipped, the prophet will say, Allah, my people, my people, did he believe in you? Allah will say, look in his heart, O messenger. If you can find an ounce of good in him, a grain of belief in his heart, then I'll take him out of this fire. And the prophet will look and say, oh, Allah, yeah, he thought makeup was haram. He told the women that it was bad and dirty. He didn't know no better. He didn't know my wives all wore it. He thought my wives uh, walked around with one eye. Aisha wouldn't let me have her walking around without her eyes. He never knew. They didn't know my wife. They didn't know that Aisha, uh, that Aisha don't let nobody tell her what to do. They didn't know that Hafsa, she inherited her father's, uh, you know, hand, heavy hand. Hafsa had a heavy hand. They didn't know that my wife, Um Salama, was a military genius. And she, you can never put an eye on her. So, oh Allah, he believed in you though. Look at his heart. I see that faith. So while you in that hell thinking, oh, I've been here forever. Then Allah will remove you. You'll be removed through the intercession of our prophet. Y'all see how this works? And I'm making it graphic. I'm being dramatic because it's my job as a dyer. This is how the prophet was. The prophet was dramatic. This is the Arabic blood in me. Subhanallah, Arabs are known for being the best storytellers. Arabs are known for being poets. And we're known for being dramatic. I get that from my father. I think so. My mother is good too, but I'm better. I think it's my father's blood. But anyway, that's how it'll be. So you will come out of the hellfire through the intercession imams of our prophet. And when Allah pulls, has the angels pull you out, Allah will ask you, a voice will say, is makeup still bad and dirty? What do you think about a woman wearing colors? What do you think about lipstick? And you will say, oh Allah, nothing that you make lawful. And you will really believe that. There's nothing wrong with makeup, nothing wrong with lipstick. And then Allah will say, enter into your paradise. So that's called the dipping. And this is the part of the hadith that we went over yesterday. Y'all saw the hadith in our hadith class, our hadith kutsi. This is a hadith kutsi. Okay. So that's what happens there. You know, uh, any, nobody. As the, the, the prophet told us in that with this wonderful hadith kutsi, you know, no one will be allowed to enter into paradise harboring anything in his heart that, that uh, belief in anything haram being good or anything good being haram. So some of us will have to go through the dipping and how will we come out of that dipping through that intercession? of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's how the grain of faith works. A lot of Muslims read that hadith about the grain of faith and think it means long as I say la ilaha illallah. That's what the mutazila, the qadariya want you to believe. They believe that long as you believe la ilaha illallah, you coming out of hell. It don't mean that. Belief is means you really believe it. It don't mean just saying it. Y'all get it? So your good deeds are not enough. Now I got to talk about you women. Because Layla's an equal opportunist. I don't, I'm not a man hater. I'm a sinful Muslim hater. You women, y'all got some serious issues. It's going to be more of us in hell than men. Let me give an example. Yes, you used to take care of the orphans. You took care of the people in need. 
You used to donate to the mosque, donate to the Muslims' children. So you're sitting on that throne of light under the shade of Allah. Now it's your turn to walk across that Sirat bridge because what is the Hadith Qudsi that we learned yesterday? No one will take their seat in paradise until they have settled the scores in this world. So you got all these deeds because you were sitting on that throne of light. You dressed in that robe garment. Oh, yeah, red. You dressed in that silk red garment, that silk glittery uh, hijab with diamonds on it and rubies. You got a crown on your head, too. And you walking down that Surat Bridge and you got to give up deeds. You did not like polygamy. You used to tell people that polygamy was bad. Polygamy was dirty. It was oppressive. It was wrong. It was unfair. So your deeds just being taken away from you. All that charity you gave. All them poor children you took care of. The donations you made to Sunna followers. All of that. The lectures you gave. The Arabic you taught women, other women. You losing them deeds, left and right, they falling off of you because in your heart, you really believe that polygamy was bad. In your heart, you don't understand why Allah would give a man the right to have two, three, four women. In your heart, you really believe that it's oppressive to the children. All this because of whatever reason, whatever you went through, your mama went through, your daddy, whatever. I don't know. But because you believe that when you get to the end of that bridge, your deeds are gone. You're going to look at Allah. Oh, Allah. I, I helped the children. I gave all my money and charity. You will hear a voice say, but in your heart, you believe that polygamy is bad, that it's dirty. Yes, I, but I do. I'm going to have to have you dipped in that hellfire because you cannot enter my garden believing anything I made lawful is bad, dirty, oppressive. So you got to go through the same thing that that imam in front of you went through. Them angels going to grab you and yank you, throw you in that fire. And while you in there screaming and hollering, the prophet is at that edge of that bridge. He'll say, oh, Allah, she's my people. She's one of my people. She's one of my people, Allah. She was on that throne. Allah will say, look in her heart. If you can find a grain or a barley seed of faith, unadulterated, then I'll take her out. And the prophet will say, I can see in her heart of law, she believed in you. She didn't know that polygamy was good. The religion, the Sunnah, it disappeared when I died, oh Allah. The men, the men made a mockery of this religion, just like the, you know, uh, uh, the women made. She was married to men, Allah, who abused your law and turned something good into something bad. But she never denied you, Allah. She never denied that polygamy was a part of the religion. She just didn't think it was fair. She didn't believe it was fair because of the way the men abused this. Please, Allah, remove her. And while you in there going through that burning, oh, go, go, go. Uh, this may have happened, took just a second in this world. But it seemed like you was in hell for a million years. But it was really just a second. That's when Allah will have the angels move you out, pull you out. That's the dipping. 
And when you come out, Allah is going to ask you, do you think polygamy is bad and dirty? Oh, no, Allah. How could I ever think anything like that? SubhanAllah, the, the El Hurin are my sisters in faith, and my husband will have a million of them. Was I stupid to believe that? How could I have ever thought that anything that you made lawful was bad and dirty? So that dipping will change your heart and make your heart accept what's good and clean. And then Allah will allow you to take your seat. So that's how the intercession of our prophet will work for us. Those of us who were on that throne, those of us who didn't, who were not, you know, upon major stuff like the, the other people. So those are the two different types. Some of us will receive his intercession because of the, um, the supplication we made and others for the sins that we died upon. Y'all get that? That's how it'll come. I use the throners because a lot of people don't know that the people of the throne have to go through the settling of scores too. The sinful Muslims are the ones that receive their book of deeds behind their back, you know, and they will be doing some time in hell. The people of the throne are put on those thrones because they did the deeds, but they too have to go through that Sirach bridge, the selling of the scores. And that's why I use them as an example because we hear about the sinful Muslims. The sinful Muslims are going to fall off that bridge. The sinful Muslims that died upon fornication. These are the Muslims that didn't pray their prayers. These are the Muslims that didn't give in charity. These are the Muslims that smoked marijuana, drank alcohol, didn't wear hijab. And they knew that these things were wrong, but they died doing them because they were weak. They're going to be on that hellfire real quick. They ain't going to even make it across that bridge, not even an, an, an inch. Okay? So how will they come out? They too will come out from the intercession of our prophet Muhammad and not just him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. There will be other people allowed to intercede too. The people who died upon sins of fornication and things like that, you know, they may do longer times, a, a longer time in hell. Those people on the throne will have to go through the dipping. The people on the throne had the deeds, but their heart was filled with things that they thought were bad that aren't. They are the ones that will be dipped. The people not on the throne, these are the Muslims that died in bad standing with Allah. They were in the hell fire when they were in their graves. They're going to be raised up and they got to go across that bridge and they will be wearing garments of, of, of tar, garments of scab, because to show that they are the ones that deliberately, intentionally disobeyed Allah. The throne people harbored in their heart bad things, in their heart, but they had the deeds. The Muslims of the, that will get their deeds behind the, their back didn't have the deeds. Y'all understand? They were the ones that didn't have the deeds because they died upon sins that took away their deeds. When you don't pray your prayers, none of your other good deeds are accepted. If you sisters do not wear hijab, none of your other deeds are accepted. So these people ain't got no deeds to give up anyway. So they're going right to hell. They're going to get on that strop bridge and be dragged off into the hell fire. Y'all understand? I'm trying to make the picture more understandable. I'm putting all the hadiths together so y'all can understand what's going on. Some are walking across the bridge. Those are the throne people. And some don't even get to take two steps. They going down. Those are the ones that had no deeds. So now we talking about it. The ones that don't have the deeds, how will they come out? 
Some of them will come out through the intercession of the prophet too, the same way he will intercede for them based on their belief. And there will be other people who will be, will intercede too. Okay. For example, uh, the martyrs, remember we talked about how the martyrs will be able to intercede too. They'll be interceding and also um, uh, uh, others that Allah allows. So there will be other people interceding too who Allah allows to intercede for those sinful Muslims. And if there is no one to intercede for those sinful Muslims, our prophet will still intercede for them too. Look at how our prophet thought about us. After the people of the throne get through that Sarat bridge, that's when the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will say, oh Allah, the rest of my people, my people who are down there, oh Allah, because Allah will say, your throners, the people of the throne have made it across, O Muhammad. He say, but the rest of my people, he will say, Allah, the rest. What do you mean the rest? The, one who, the ones who died upon major sins, who have no one else to intercede for them. The ones who had no good deeds at all. That's the man who committed murder. He killed over 100 people. Never did a good deed in his life. That's the man who had himself cremated after he, but he never did a good deed in his life. That's the, the brother who never prayed, never gave in charity, was a horrible person. He slandered people, backbeat bit people. These people that we read those hadiths about, they never did a good deed in their life, but they believed in Allah. They never associated partners with him and they did not die denying their belief in him. Allah will say, if you can find a pea of faith in their heart, I'll take them out, O Muhammad. And that's when our prophet will use that supplicate, that, that, uh, that wish for all people of my nation even the ones that never did a good deed in their life. Oh Allah, those that believed in you and didn't die in disbelief, please Allah, bring them out of the fire. And that's when Allah will have the angels pour them out. Allah will tell the angels to look for anyone in the fire who, who has an ounce of belief, who never did good deeds. Bring them out because they are the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's how they will come out. So do y'all understand how this intercession works? We all have to go across that Sarat bridge, even those of us that were sitting on thrones of light. The people on thrones of light will make it across, okay? But some of them, not all of them, some of them will have to be dipped. And I gave y'all two examples of some people who will be on the throne but have to be dipped. That's why you imams got to be careful telling Muslims what's haram. You brothers who call yourselves men of knowledge, you have to be careful answering questions. Be careful doing your Q&A show. Just like I got my Q&A show every Friday. But I'm careful. I don't answer no question without a hadith to prove it, a clear hadith. And I always throw in an example from the companions. I don't use Imam Malik's opinion. I don't use Sheikh Elbani's opinion. I don't use Sheikh Morsi. We had the question come up about eyelashes, those fake eyelashes. I told the people what Sheikh Morsi would say. I also told them what Sheikh Atlee would say. And then I told them the best way 
is to avoid that when there are alternatives. The alternative is fiber lash mascara, which is what I wear. You don't need nothing fake if you wear fiber lash mascara because it lengthens and soothes and conditions your lashes and makes them grow naturally. You know, we have to be careful because if we answer based on what we think, that's when you fall into the dipping character, uh, category. I don't want to be dipped in hell. None of us should not want to be dipped in hell, not even for a second. I want to be of the right hand. The people of the throne are not necessarily people of the right hand, y'all. Who are the people of the right hand? The people of the right hand, these are the people that earned the love of Allah, not just his mercy, but his love too, because they didn't transgress those limits. So don't just pray to be on that throne, because some of the people of the throne, they got the deeds, but they harboring the dislike of what's good and clean in their heart. Or the, the like for something that's bad and dirty in their heart. You brothers out there debating Islam. I'm going to give an example of a lot of you brothers who may have the deeds, but you're harboring a like for something that's bad and dirty. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was not sent here to debate this religion with anyone, not with you, nor with the people of the book. The people who Allah will hate the most on the day of judgment are those men and women that debated this religion. Those people will do some time in hell. You brothers who are sitting around debating Islam with the Christians and Jews, and you're debating with people who have no interest. You're, this is not Islam. So all those good deeds you brothers are doing, all those prayers, those fasts, they may put you on a throne of light. You got the deeds, but your heart ain't pure. You have to hate what Allah hates. He hates debating. Stop debating this religion with Christians. Stop debating this religion with Jews. Stop debating this religion with Muslims. Stop believing that you're given dawah because that is not dawah. The prophet was clear. Debating is hated. It is not a form of dawah. That's not how we get. Allahu alayhi wa sallam said the true dawah is from your actions, Aki. You need a woman like Layla to remind you behind every man that's good, there's always a woman. Well, I'm the woman behind you brothers who are trying to be upon Quran and Sunnah. I'm reminding you, y'all got to stop debating with these Christians. It's Haram to debate. That's not calling nobody to Islam. That's arguing, debating, making us look bad. Okay? That's not what our prophet did. That is not what any of the companions did. None of them, male or female. Okay? And they went to real Christian countries. They never did that. So you brothers that are doing it, you looking at the dipping until you stop that, until you change your heart, you're going to be in this group of dippers. I don't want to be in that group. Not even for a second. Ponder this. Study the Hadiths, brothers. A lot of you may have memorized the Quran, but I can look at a lot of you younger Daya that's coming up. You brothers do not know the Hadiths. You did not learn them. And I'm, I'm here to tell you the truth. You got to learn them when you're young, when you're a child like that little girl in my class, Sabrina. Some of y'all just, you're too old to learn because the older we get, we can't memorize well. 
And I don't care if you set up and read the 40 Hadiths of Imam Nawi. That ain't how we learn the Hadiths. No, you got to learn the Sitta. You got to learn all them Sitta, every Hadith and those Sittas. The meaning behind them. Just because you read a book or that's a 40 Hadith for somebody, that don't make you no scholar of Hadith. What are you talking about? That ain't how we learn Hadith. I'm sorry, that ain't getting it. You brothers need to learn the Hadith and you would learn about the companions. You would learn about the prophets. You would learn how to give dawah. You would learn that what's lawful. You would learn what the Hadiths are the key to the knowledge of Islam because the Hadiths are the explanation of the Quran. You will never, my brothers, understand the Quran until you brothers learn those Hadiths. There's only one famous brother that I listen to who I like listening to because I can tell he learns like I did from the true scholars of Hadith. I just told him recently, I can tell that he was a student of Sheikh Elbani for real. I can tell that he was a student of Sheikh Uthay mean for real because he not only talks like me, but when he answers questions, he answers like me. He answers with the Hadiths, not no imam, no scholar of you. And he gives examples from the companions like I do. His teachers taught him the way Sheikh Morsi taught me. And my teacher, Sheikh Morsi, was also personal friend of Elbani, Uthameen, Ben Baz, and not just them, Karadari and them too. Because Sheikh Morsi, Morsi is a real scholar too. He is. He's a real one. He ain't the kind that went to some online school and got a certificate in it. He's a real one too. One of the few that's left living. Most of the scholars of Hadith have died. Karadari and them have died. Elbani and them have died. Sheikh Morsi's still living. Alhamdulillah, he's old, but he's still here. May Allah preserve him. But the rest of you brothers, all y'all do is fatwa. All y'all do is imam this, shake this, Ibn Taymiyyah. I love Ibn Taymiyyah, but I'm sorry, I would never quote Ibn Taymiyyah as Dalil to anything. My Dalil would be what those companions said. What those companions, if there's something that's not clear, I'm not going to tell you what Ibn, Ibn Tayyamiya said. I definitely ain't going to tell you what Ibn, Ka, Ibn Kalthir said either. We getting further and further away from the, the originals. I'm going to tell you like I do with my fatwas on makeup. I'm going to tell you what Aisha said, what Ibn Abbas said, what Abu Bakr said, Saeed al Kudri, Zubair, El Os. The originals, because nobody understood this religion better than them. You brothers that are famous better learn from Layla, the woman that's not famous. Learn from the infamous Layla. And I use the word infamous because that's the person you love to hate. I am infamous. I'm not famous. I'm infamous to the people. Famous with Allah, inshallah. Famous with Aisha and the prophet. Famous with those companions, inshallah, because I'm a protector of the Sunnah. A true protector of the Sunnah. You brothers are deviating more and more and more away from it. Especially with this debating Islam. Stop it. Turn on a YouTube and your video come up and you sitting here arguing with Christians about the Bible and the Quran when the prophet said, don't even touch those books. Because they don't exist. And you call yourself a scholar. A sh one of the shuk. You're not a scholar. You young brothers will never be scholars until y'all learn to, that Islam is based on two sources. The Quran and the Hadiths. Not a mathab. Not a fatwa. Not reading Bibles. You brothers are not scholars. You're not. Now my old main is. Sheikh Atli is. You'll never see him toting no Bible. 
But the rest of you brothers, y'all got a long way to go. But look at how old Shake Atley is too. Age. You brothers are too young to be calling yourselves scholars anyway. You ain't experienced life. You, I'm talking about you American brothers. You have not experienced life long enough. Life ain't whooped your behind enough. Because if life whooped your behind, you wouldn't be making the mistakes you guys are making. You're too young. And most of y'all are too young to be answering questions about Islam. Leave it to people like Sheikh Atley. Leave it to people like Sheikh Morsi. Leave it to, that's only, leave it to people like Sheikh Kobisi. I wonder if y'all know him. He's a scholar of Hadith. I don't know if he's back in America. He was in Saudi teaching. He might be back. Leave it to Sheikh Kobisi. These are people I know in America that I trust with that because they're not going to deviate from that Quran and Sunnah. They're not going to deviate. Okay? And the other brother I'm talking about don't even live here now. He's in England. Okay? He's the only one that answers like me. Okay, Supana Allah, Supana Allah. So until you brothers come to the Quran and sooner, you going through the dipping. Just like until you sisters learn to love polygamy and everything else. I didn't say you have to practice it. If your husband, you know that your husband ain't qualified to practice polygamy, then don't. And I would tell you, most of these men in America ain't qualified to practice anything. I'm telling you, because they live off of fatwa. They don't know the sooner. I wouldn't do polygamy with none of these brothers in America. I have to find one that knows the sooner. And they hard to come by. So you girls, you women shouldn't be in that situation anyway, if you ask me. He got to be a man that lives and breathes the sunnah of the prophet with the understanding of those companions. And they're rare to come by. People claim to be of that group, of that saved set, but they're not. They're not. But you don't cause the human to make you hate what Allah made good and clean. So until you sisters learn to make your heart love what Allah loves and only hate what Allah hates, you're going to be dipped in that hell fire too, even though you did good deeds. So the dipping people, I had to talk about them. Now, there are some intercessions. Like, like I said, the prophets, the other prophets of Allah will be allowed to intercede, the martyrs and the scholars. I'm talking to real scholars. They'll be able to intercede for the people. Also, your deeds. We talked about that, how the Quran will intercede for you. If you in that hellfire, the Quran will say, oh, Allah, he used to read me at night. He used to ponder my meanings and apply them to himself. Your fast will intercede for you. And also other righteous people, whoever Allah allows that's righteous will be allowed to intercede for you to come out of hell. But the kind of insert intercession that will not be allowed is what the Christians believe. The type of intercession that will not be allowed is uh, uh, what the innovators believe. The innovators believe that their scholars can have the power to intercede. That's not true. Allah tells us that no one will be able to intercede on that day except those whom he allowed. And the only people that Allah will allow to intercede are those people whom he is pleased with. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, who is he that can intercede unless I allow it? They cannot intercede unless I am pleased with it. And I'm going to give you an example. Our prophet Muhammad, see how the Hadith's brothers, I'm not answering with no fatwa, some Sheikh comma dime a dozen, Sheikh Morsi, Sheikh Elbani, Sheikh Ben Baz. I'm not using no Ibn Taymiyyah fatwa. I ain't using no fo imam. Listen to what the prophet, how he explained that verse. The Hadiths have the explanation to the Quran. 
The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the example of Prophet Abraham. Abraham was a friend of Allah. He's the prophet that Allah made a close friend. Abraham's father died a kafir. But Allah will not accept the intercession of Abraham in regards to his father. Listen to what the prophet said. This hadith is authentic. He said, Abraham will meet his father, Azar, on the day of judgment. And Azar's face will be covered in dust and dark. Abraham will say to his father, didn't I tell you not to disobey me, to listen to me? And his father will say, I won't disobey you today. And then Abraham will, will say to Allah, oh Allah, you promised me that you would not disgrace me on this day when everybody is resurrected. And what disgrace Allah is greater than the fact that my father is one of the people that will be thrown in hell. Allah will say, Abraham, I have forbade paradise to any and all disbelievers. Then it will be said to Abraham, look under your feet. And Abraham will look and he will see animal blood stain that will be caught by the legs and thrown into the air fire. Abraham's father used to sacrifice to other than Allah. He denied that Allah is the only one worthy of worship. So because of that, he's a kafir and he will be thrown in hell forever. So that hadith is the dalil. Not what Imam Ahmed have to say about it. That hadith is the dalil from our prophet that in order for Allah to allow a person to come out of hell, that person must be someone whom Allah was pleased with too. So he will allow the prophets to intercede too. But some of the prophets like Abraham will try to intercede for their families. Allah will not allow it because your family was a kafir. This hadith is also the dalil, that there will be no kafirs in paradise. You can't intercede for your mother if your mother died a Christian. You cannot intercede for your sister if she died a Jew. You cannot intercede for your uncle if he was an atheist. They're going to be in hell forever. They're never coming out. So this is a detailed, and I tried to detail it. It took me time to put all those hadiths together so I can make them all one for you. Because I'm going to tell you guys, when you read the hadiths, and any other scholar of hadith would tell you this, one thing about the hadiths, there's hard for people that are old, like us, the age we are, to learn them. Because they're not in no order anyway. You know, you can find 10 hadiths that's all part of one kutbah that the prophet gave. You have to know that entire kutbah to know that those hadiths went with that, okay? You have to learn the stuff when you're young, when the mind is fresh. I started learning these hadiths when I was seven, eight. How old was I? Seven, eight years old. I was doing reports on them. You know, at the masjid every Sunday, reports on them to my stepfather and mother. You know, by the time I was 12 years old, I gave my first lecture. I gave my first lecture. It was the Fikr of marriage. Guess who I gave it to? The women from Zarina's mosque, uh, Imam Matisse's mosque. <laughs> we had a tea when I was 12 years old. I wonder if Mukhtar's father remembers this. We had a tea at our mosque. And the uh, uh, masjid, uh, Imam Matisse masjid came and we all, and they had me, I was 12. I had to stand up before all these sisters and read a poem. And I read a poem and then I had to do a lecture on the fiqh of marriage on what, what is a, what makes a constitutes a valid marriage contract. I had to talk about what constitutes a valid marriage contract. And this was all taken out of Sahih Bukhari. Because we had just completed, Mukhtar's mother was my teacher. And we had just completed, like Mukhtar said, she's a historian. 
She has a degree in history. She's a historian. And we had just completed the entire Bukhari nine volumes. And my assignment was to be able to stand before Imam Latif Alameen's community and do a lecture on the fiqh of marriage. And I was 12, a little scrawny, ugly 12 year old, no makeup on. Oh, I did have my cold, I always wore cold, and I always wore lipstick. But I was the ugliest looking kid to me. Mukhtar got a picture of me on his on our Moshi page. People don't even know that's me. And I ain't going to tell y'all which picture it is, Atifa. Y'all can't even recognize me. Layla sitting there 12 years. I don't look like me. I was a funny looking thing growing up. But anyway, I gave a lecture on the fika of marriage. All y'all from Imam, Imam Atis, come here. Y'all remember me? I don't look the same. I was that little girl that gave that poem. What was the poem? What am I? What am I? Am I bold or am I shy? Remember this, Shag Atley? You was around then. Am I realistic or am I a dream? Do you find me attractive or do you find me obscene? Do I try to do right or do I try to do wrong? Do I seem to be with you as if with a charm? Do I care about the way things should be? Or do I dwaddle like a fool over what they used to be? I ask myself these questions as I try to survive. I can't remember the rest. I do the best I can. When I say I try to survive, I can't remember the rest. But I ended it with, what am I? I am woman. That was the poem I had to read for this women's the first women's conference of the Darul Islam. We were Darul Islam. It was the Masjid of Atlanta, the Masjid of New York. And I had to stand there, this little skinny, little scrawny 12-year-old girl, read that poem and do a lecture on what constitutes a valid marriage contract. What are the rights of a woman? What are the rights of a man based on Bukhari? Y'all remember me now? That's me, Layla. Sheikh Adley, do you remember that little girl? Didn't know that I grew up and married you one day, did you? Yep, ah, that was me. <laughs> Khalid Yassin, you remember? Yeah, Khalid Yassin was around back in them days. They were the age of my stepfather and, and my and them. And I was that little scrawny girl, a little kid, like Sabrina. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, guys, we got to learn these hadiths because the hadiths are the explanation of the Quran. A lot of people don't know about the dipping. A lot of people don't understand how the intercession will work. It's because they don't understand the hadiths. The prophet was very detailed. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that every prophet spoke about paradise spoke about hell, spoke about intercession to their people. But our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went in more detail about it than anyone else. He detailed it more than anyone else. It's just that we Muslims today don't know the Sunnah. Like he said, the Hadith will become abandoned. We've replaced the Hadith with fatwa. We've replaced it with Sheikh so-and-so, Islam Q&A, IslamOrg.com, whatever they are. Get back to the Sunnah brothers and your teachings. We're too busy debating with Kafirs, debating with the Christians, thinking that we're giving dawah when they're giving dawah to you. They're taking you further and further and further away from the way of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are not the safe set. We have to stop calling ourselves the save set and learn what the save set really is. The prophet said the save set. Who is the saved set? One of the companions asked him, who is the saved set? He said, those are the Muslims that remain upon traditional Islam. They said, what is traditional Islam, O prophet? 
Traditional Islam is what I was sent here with. It's what you adhere to. And it's what those first four leaders after me will adhere to. That's the traditional Islam. He said, stick to those people. Stick to the people that hang and hold on to the traditional Islam. Stick with them and hold on to traditional Islam if it means you have to hold on to the trunk of a tree. That's the save set, people. You brothers don't know what it is. That's it. How can you call yourself a save set when all you care about is fatwa from Sheikh El Bani? That's it. He was a good man, but he's not a companion. How can you call yourself the safe set when you're sitting around debating with Kafirs? When the prophet forbade this, he said these will be the first people thrown in hell. You brothers, after you've taken off those thrones of light, you're going to do some time because you thought debating was good. You thought it was dour. Learn about the safe set. Learn about those companions and then aspire to be one of them, to be like them. Aisha's mine. The people of knowledge, you brothers know who my role model is. Aisha, I'm a walking example of her and a talking one like her too. Got the heavy hand like Hafsa. Oh yeah, I got the heavy hand like Hafsa. Mixed with her too. And I got the strategy of Um Salama. I got them other wives mixed in me too. But I'm more Aisha with my tongue. That's the problem. Okay. All right, we're going to stop right here for today. The next time we meet for this class, we'll continue. We're going to talk about what happens then. I'm going to answer the question that you have, Bethany. Bethany wants to know, will there be any non-Muslims coming out of the hellfire? I've already given that answer. Allah said in that hadith that he will not allow any kafirs into the, into the paradise. But you believe that your mother was a, was a Muslim because she believed in her book? We're going to save that for the, when we meet next week. Okay? All right. So I, wa I want to close out here for tonight. And I apologize for keeping you guys so long. Since I kept you so long with this class, we'll postpone the Hadith class for tomorrow. Because we went over so many Hadiths here. And I did want to go into detail about the intercession. So I'm going to close out here. Supana kala huma wa biham dika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Stak firuka wa tubui lake. Are there any questions? I will take questions. Y'all know I ain't the kind of dyer that leaves. I'm pretty sure you got some. Let me look inside the, the um, uh oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me look inside the server. Uh, get your questions. Yeah, Facebook, YouTube. I can see y'all's comments. Any questions? Go ahead. Zoom. Go ahead. Any questions, comments, or comments? Yeah, the brothers are not going to hear me. One of the sisters typing that this was so good. She hopes that these other brothers listen. The brothers don't listen to me. I'm sorry, sisters. I'm a woman. Y'all know them brothers. They too up and they fame. They famous. What did David Bowie say? Fame, fame, fame. They'll never hear my lecture. They don't listen to me. The men don't listen to me. That's why I ain't got that many followers. Even on YouTube, I don't have, they got thousands of people that watch their lectures. When they go live on YouTube, they have a thousand people in there. I go live, I got 80. Those brothers will never hear this lecture. They don't listen to me. Not like that, they don't. When I reprimand and get in my reprimanding mode, they tune me out. Yeah, so they don't care. But yeah, at least the law knows I addressed it. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Thank you for sharing that though, sister. Thank you for that. Long as you sisters are hearing me and you brothers that's here are hearing me, that's good enough. You can Thank you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. You can raise your sons right. You women can raise your sons to be better men and to be leaders, better leaders over us. Yeah. Which gives us a better chance. Yeah. Because if the children are listening. Yeah, the children. I got kids in here. Yeah, my kids will grow up and be good die. I'm so proud of Sabrina. 
I heard her. My baby. And the thing is, Zarina's baby is like that too. All my kids are smart. <laughs> yeah, Zarina, what did your daughter say? Didn't she have the right answer too? That girl's as smart as a whip too. Zarina's little kid probably know these hadiths. It's just, and, and um, Zarina knows these answers too. All of y'all do. It's just the way y'all articulate. Y'all got to work on articulation. All my students know these answers. But y'all just have the problem that you guys have that I see is articulation. Some of you are getting better. I mean, the Fresno, you're getting better with your articulation. Just to let you know, old woman Fresno is getting better. Yeah. yeah. Norto yeah. and them are good. Yeah, I'm you have it in, you, in you, you feel it, you know exactly what to say. Yeah. But when it comes out, it comes out different. Yours is always right, though, Sabrine. I think because you're a writer. You you pick up on words. You never get a when you do answer, you don't answer that often. But when you do answer, your questions all your answers are always right because you know how to choose your words. I think that's because you're a writer. It's just expressing ourselves. Only way I can do it is because I went to college for it, guys. Come on. My mother and him had me go to school for that stuff. Yeah. But um, it's just expression. Well, it worked. Yeah. Yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope everybody, I just wish more people would listen, more brothers would listen. Yeah, these brothers need to listen, but they don't. I'm a woman. They don't want to listen to no women. Yeah, I agree. Like articulating is another um, skill with learning Islam. And um, I don't feel like I'm progressing in that area as much. You as are, to, you are, but didn't but you? I feel like my heart and my life and my in, insight in the way I'm, experience in life is I'm growing. So I'm so happy about that. And I know you are because look at your daughter. She's brilliant. Your daughter knew that answer though, didn't she? <laughs> she's yeah, she's she, you. She's you, but she's but you can tell that you've put your all in her Quran Tajweed is perfect. She can be I in think that, that they don't overthink younger children. Yeah, they don't oh yeah it's and she's now, it's, a, it's a baggage that yeah. we develop in age. Sometimes we, we overthink yeah. it and mix it all up. And yeah. The little kids don't have that kind of Right. Baggage that right. We, right. We, we are attained or whatever. Maybe yeah, that's what it is. It that's what I think. Yeah. Because yeah, you like can. Little versions of us. And the, just the, I was going to say, the children are reflections of you. The simple fact that your daughter is as brilliant shows that you know the stuff. Just like Sabrina. Her mother don't ever answer no questions in here. Her mama don't get on that mic at all. But I can tell that she's taking everything and putting it to them kids. You know what I mean? Look at Sabrina. Okay. So you, it, the children are a reflection of you all. That's all, you know, and, and Zarina, you're excellent. I mean, you got this dean that you know your religion. You may not can articulate, but you know your dean. That ain't no doubt. And that shows in that daughter of yours and in you. Look how strong you she are. She has the advantage of starting off young. Yeah, she, but look how strong Zarina is. Zarina, that's my girl. She's like me. Zarina, you are a lot like me. I'm just older than you, that's all. But uh, you're a lot like me, and I, I'm hoping that you will be able to run this website too. That's why I'm. Yeah, I have one thing about saying I love Islam, and I, I know. just and I pray a lot. You know, I know a lot knows my heart, but I have to work on the weak areas. You know, just articulation. So that That's the only thing that you weak yeah. in. I want you to be yeah. able to articulate I, I like me. Writing, when it comes to talking, sometimes I don't know. <laughs> no, just I'm gonna listen more, a little bit more too. Yeah, I just want you yeah. to get that because I'm hoping that if I die, you will be here to run it. That's what I'm hoping. I'm I'm we, like we Dr. Assam. We looking for people to take over after us because we're old. Sheikh Atley going through that too. When we're old, we all got one foot in the grave. Sheikh Morrissey the same. We got one foot in the grave and we looking for people to keep it going. And I'm hoping that you, Pfizer, Fred, Fresno got one foot in the grave too. I can't depend on her. You know, but we hoping that you and Pfizer and Norto and Malion and Habiba and Yasmin, y'all keep this going when we gone. And I want you to be the lady. Because I know you got it makes that me strength. Cry. I think about all the Umis and the Abbeys that's passing away. And we're becoming the Umis and Abbeys. Yes. You know, and it's just like, well, I'm not ready. I want to still be nine years old, you yeah. know, again. And it's just so emotional. No, you need to be and the lady. I'm trying to get it. But, you know, we started later in life, a lot of us. But yeah. we got to keep trying. And I want you to be yeah. the me because you got that strength I got too, because I know where you come from. 
It's all about yeah, where we come from. It's humiliating, but I have to keep trying because I know mm-hmm. it's more humiliating giving up, you know? Yeah. You That's come from where I come up. from. We come from the same. We're the same. So I know you can run this. And Pfizer have your back and Norto and Meleon and all them, but you got to be the one to lead. It's got to be you. Out of everybody that's in here, the, to lead is you. And I know that. And they'll have your back. You know? Yeah, any question? Yeah, let me look on. A, yeah, let me look on YouTube again. I'm, y'all see I'm working this camera. Now, any comments? Okay, we had a lot of people in here today. Mashallah. Okay, guys, I want to thank everybody for joining and participating. I want y'all to sit down with y'all families. This morning, in the morning when y'all wake up for Fajr, start letting your family know that we it's going to be a new day because Ramadan will be starting in a couple of days. You want to get those two boxes put up in your house, those two charity boxes, one box for the poor and needy, the other box for you and your family when y'all make mistakes. You want to also continue to clean your house up physically. And let the children and your wives know that you're going to start praying the sooner prayers together. You're going to start waking up for Fajr together. You're going to be eating Sahur together. Put all these things I'm teaching y'all into practice now, you know, because we ain't got but a couple of days. And I need to text Sheikh Morsi too about some of y'all just reminding me I need to do something for him. Tomorrow we have the stories of the prophets. Yes. Bethany. The story of the prophets are is tomorrow. I don't know which one. We finished up Noah. I have to look to see. Yeah, we finished Noah. You missed that. You weren't here last time, Bethany. Yeah, I did Noah last this week. Last week. Yeah, and make sure everybody buys the book that I posted up on YouTube and Facebook, A Shake At Least. The book. We're going to start that too next week. That's about the Quran. I showed y'all the the contents. Y'all seen the contents? That book is a masterpiece. That's a masterpiece. Buy that book. I'm going to be teaching it every day, Monday through Friday, rather, at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. All right. Since there's no other questions and no other comments. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see this. Prophet Sully. Okay. Maybe I'll do him. I never can pronounce his name right. Sully, y'all know how I'll mess a name up. That's one thing about Layla. I nickname everybody. Prophet Sully. Yeah, we'll do Sully. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I'll do him tomorrow. Yeah, because his is kind of short. His is short, so I'll probably do him. That's something short. <laughs> I got to put that together. Yeah, I'll do him because it's uh, it's just a little bit about him. That means I ain't got to do a lot of writing tonight. Yeah, I'll do him because I do want to hit my book tonight. Y'all know I'm trying to publish my novel. You know, I'm trying. I got to finish writing it. Every time I this website is getting in the way of my uh, book I've been writing. But I'm going to try to stay up tonight and do my book too. You know, I need to put at least another chapter in there. And I got a lot of stuff going in my mind of what to do with it. Yeah. Okay. So, and yes, I will. A lot of the people, for those of you who don't know, I've been logging in at night, testing the surf software. I've been logging in at night on YouTube and Facebook, keeping lectures going for those people who want to be listening to lectures. Yesterday I played this series. Did y'all hear it? I played the series on the resurrection. I played my series. Yeah, I, yeah it's just, I tried to get y'all caught up. Tonight, I'll play another, maybe I'll play Mukhtar. Mukhtar series on the stories of the companions. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll play yeah, that way you can learn about the companions. What I'll do tonight, after I log out and um, get set up here in my house, I'll log back in on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and Instacart, and I'm going to put on the series of the stories of the companions of Brother Mukhtar, my cousin. A lot of you are asking about those companions again. Okay, so yeah, just tune in. When y'all see me go live, come on in. I'll keep the webs. The Zoom room is open 24 hours. I'll keep YouTube open. Moderators on YouTube, I need y'all to keep an eye on it. Norto, when y'all at work. Yeah, go ahead, Sally. Norto, when y'all at work, please check that YouTube channel because I'm going to need y'all to moderate it. Yeah, go ahead, Sally. You have a question? 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, type your question. Yeah, Sally's got a question. Can y'all see it there? <laughs> Okay, here's her question. Let me take that down. Put it here so I can read it. I like to put it here so I can read it. Do you have lectures that discuss the balance? Yes, that's what we, that's my Tawhi classes. I'm always speaking about how to balance. How do we balance ourselves? That's the jihad. When you guys hear about jihad and nafs, the struggle between the self, as Muslims, we're spending every day of our life trying to keep the balance between love, hope, and fear. Because all three of those ingredients has to be equally balanced. Sometimes our fear goes up. We have to bring it back down. Sometimes our hope goes down. We have to bring it back up. So yes, I talk about how to balance love, hope, and fear all the time, every day. This is what all our classes are based on. When you find yourself, first of all, do you understand what fear is? Fear is to fear Allah's punishment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you will never be a believer until you love Allah and you fear his punishment and have hope of his forgiveness. We all struggle with that. The fear of Allah's punishment is what keeps you from disobeying him. You know that if you disobey Allah, he gets angry. You don't want to make him angry. So you balance that by staying away from those things that will cause him to get angry. Hope means that if you do commit a sin, if you do find that you have weakened and committed a sin, you repent from it. And after you repent, you have to have hope that Allah has accepted your repentance and keep it moving. That's hard for every Muslim. That's hard for every human being. So all of us, myself included, we all struggle with that. It's a struggle. But I'm going to tell you, Sally, it gets easier as you live longer. Okay, you're just, you are a recent uh, convert. You just converted to Islam a few weeks ago. It's a struggle for you now, but it's going to get easier for you as each day goes by. Just understand that you know the things that you're supposed to be doing as a Muslim. So you, oh, you've been, you're 21 years. Okay, it's another Sally. I got you mixed up with another Sally. The other Sally's only converted two weeks ago. Okay. Well, mashallah, you were 21 years and it should be a little bit easier for you. You know, when you find yourself weakening, when you find yourself making a mistake, just turn back to Allah. Ask Allah to forgive you of your sins. Ask Allah to forgive you and know that once you repent, the slate is clean and keep it moving. Oh, yeah. Oh, Sally, you one of my old students from MySpace. Oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, you were from MySpace. Yeah, I'm, we have another Sally that just converted. She's new too, but you're a different one. Okay, it's your last name I didn't recognize. Okay, because you didn't use your last name before. Yeah, oh, yes. Okay, I understand who you are. Yeah, welcome back. I missed you too, Sally. You used to always have good questions here. I miss you. I'm glad you're back. Yeah. Did you get him back? I meant to ask you, did you get him back? Well, now he's 26. Are you spending time with him now? Are you seeing your son now? Do you get to see him? I remember her. SubhanAllah. Life is filled with so many trials, guys. And when we go through trials, uh, you know, when we go through trials, it makes us stronger. 
Oh, alhamdulillah, Masha Allah, Sally. Oh, I'm so happy for you. I thought about you over the years. I thought about a lot of y'all over the years. I was sad to hear about Holly. Did you hear that Holly died recently? You remember Holly, Sally? Oh my God. So yeah. Oh, so he was in Egypt. Okay. El mashallah. So you got a daughter. Uh, oh my God. You got two daughters now. Yeah. Holly just died. They had her funeral last Friday. Holly was another one of our Latina uh, MySpace sisters, guys. They used to come to my website. And that really uh, broke my heart to hear that she died. I, I don't know what happened, but I heard it was COVID maybe. Yeah. Life, girl, we've, look at, girl, look at us. You got a 17 and an 18-year-old now, subhanAllah. Oh, my gosh, girl. Well, mashallah, I'm glad that everything worked out for you. I tell you one thing, though, Sally, the trials of life. That should help you to keep your uh, hope up because a lot, you know, the long story and the short story, it worked out. That should be what encourages you to keep your hope balanced, that there's always hope. We never give up. We never lose the faith. And because that we know that a law is there to help us, that should keep your fear balanced too. You want to stay in good standing with a law. You want to, to stay in standing where Allah will always help you in your time of need. So that's how we balance out that uh, fear. Hope and fear work together. Love, hope, and fear, all three work together. But it's a struggle for us. We, uh, we go through it. And the stronger your faith is, guys, the more Allah will test you with that. Oh, you back in South Dakota now? Oh, mashallah. <laughs> That's South Dakota. <sighs> yeah, it was you and Anita. You know Anita married my brother. It was you and Anita in that South Dakota. I remember that. Yeah, and you're raising girls alone. Honey. Ain't that something? You're raising them alone, but that's okay. It's probably for the better. Because at least your girls got a, a strong woman to learn from, you know. Sometimes it's best to be by ourselves, guys. Look at me. I'm single. I'm by myself, too. But if I wasn't by myself, I probably wouldn't be able to give this dower. If I wasn't by myself, I'd probably have a man wanting me to get off the Internet and spend time with him. So we got to look at the good in everything. A lost cotter. A lost Carter, he knows what's best for us. Maybe it's best that you raising them girls alone by yourself. That way you ain't got to deal with the crap you dealt with before with that son. So we learn from what happens in the past. We learn from the bad things and grow from them. So it's probably best that you raising them by yourself. Hello, because can't nobody tell you how to do it. And it'll make you and them close. They'll learn from you how to be strong Muslim women when they grow up. Yeah, if you remember her friends, no, she was from South Dakota. Her and Anita were from South Dakota. <laughs> I used to say, what's out there in South Dakota? That's where her and Anita was from. You know, Anita ain't been back there. She married my brother. They moved, uh, her family moved to Texas. They Left that South Dakota, they say, what, nothing there. SubhanAllah. I'm glad to see my, um, I like when my older students come back. The students I had when I first started teaching on the internet, it is always so good, you know, to have them back with us, you know. Okay, Sister Sally, inshallah, I'm so glad you back and I'll t see you tomorrow, inshallah. I'm going to try to keep this uh I'm going to sign out, guys, but I'm going to keep it going. If y'all wake up in the middle of the night, join it. I'm going to try to keep this going on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter. And I'll probably put on Brother Mukhtar, my cousin Mukhtar's lectures on the stories of the companions. So I'm going to close up for right now on YouTube, but I'll log back in in about 
Give me about 30 minutes to log back in, guys. Inshallah, in 30 minutes. So that way I can take care of some of my business here. All right. So, Sapana Kalahuma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Mm.